that music was from Mending Things and composed by Gabriel Garrett in conjunction with Underworld. And it's from the 2006 movie, Breaking and Entering. It's a movie in which Jude Law plays a young English landscape architect. One night his practice that he shares with his business partner is robbed. The movie then follows Jude Law trying to identify the burglars, a respite from his home environment at the time. Once he tracks down the burglars, Miro, to Miro's home, he's left to make some hard choices that will have for lasting repercussions. Does the movie have a lot to do about gardens and landscape design? Not really, but it's not every day that Jude Law is a landscape architect. And not every day that the main protagonist in a movie is a landscape architect. It's time, I suppose, for landscape architects to be just that. Main protagonists in deciding the way our world is shaped. Good afternoon. I'm Aniket Bhagwat, and on behalf of all of us at LEAF, welcome you to the fifth and the penultimate episode of Saturday Sojourn's Modern Landscape Architecture in India. First, let me thank the many people who have joined as an audience, and I do hope all of you have enjoyed these discussions. The webinar really is about listening to the younger professionals in India, but also about reorienting the discussions and the directions of the profession. Every week, as we have today, Two offices present their work, each for a period not exceeding 20 minutes. So in all, 12 firms over six weeks. In the last session, Deepa Deepa from DLDA and Aparna Rao and Sri Ganesh Rajendra of FICUS, present, their presentations allowed for conversations about running a one-man practice or one-person practice, about joys of planting design, or of landscape design as a discipline to make healing environments, but also about the state of women in the discipline. We also discussed a recurring theme. How do we draw and represent landscapes to make our drawings empirical tools, but also ways of assessing sites and locales by the age old celebrated act of walking. For today's session, we are joined by Dipti Chandra, who founded a studio, Dirtry, in 2017. Her garden design recently won the International Garden Festival 2020, an annual landscape event conducted at the UNESCO World Heritage Site in France. It is the first Indian entry in the last 28 years to have won this. Her presentation today is titled Landscape Expressions, Memories, Symphony, and Association with Nature. And then we have Anuradha Rato of Salient Design, a multidisciplinary studio based in Kolkata. Her work comprising of architecture and landscape design projects demonstrates a certain competence of managing these works, but also of the ideas of looking at the immediate culture as an inspiration. Our presentation today is titled, One with Nature. As discussants, we have had with us always a very distinguished group of people that I hold in high esteem. Today, we are joined by a few of them who have been with us for the last many sessions and have sustained the thought-provoking and engaging conversations. Welcome again, Professor Basavda, Professor Neil Kanchaya, and Professor Nagarshade. And also, Sunil, as usual, joins me in moderating the sessions. But then today, for the first time today, joining us from Netherlands is Carrie Preston, the founder of Studio Two, the designer of living and livable outdoor spaces that are extremely tight. And in them, she manages to build many wondrous worlds. I've had the pleasure of being introduced to her and her work through a GLDA seminar in Ireland where we both recently were part of. Welcome, Carrie, and thank you for joining us today. And with that, over to you, Dipti. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Aniket Sir and Lee Foundation for organizing Saturday Sojourn. I'm honored to be a part of it. 
The topic of my talk is Landscape Expressions, Memory, Symphony and Association with Nature. My introduction to landscape has greatly been an extension of my memories and associations. They very much inspired me in my thought process and design thinking. And these even include my childhood memories and experiences. I'm sure most of us would have enjoyed running and trying to catch the milkweed flowers as a kid. These were the small joys of life. Over the years, I learned about its growth habit, the religious significance of the flowers, and its serving as a host plant for the monarch butterfly. And of course, our TV programs. Malgudi days acquainted me with the landscape and cultural stories of rural Karnataka, and the cartoon of Heidi, illustrated by Studio Ghibli, taught me about the cold, temperate regions of the Swifts Alps. I had the opportunity of staying in different states of India from a young age. The changing landscapes of each region were wonderful early lessons on how vegetation changed with different geographies and climate. A school in Orissa was based on J. Krishnamurthy's method of teaching. So education often extended beyond the classroom boundaries. This sketch is of a memory of the school picnic where these students used to collect sand leaves and stitch them into plates and eat the locally prepared delicious food on them sitting under a people tree. And later we shifted a native in Alapi district. The landscape was in stark contrast. The plants were always evergreen, the weather was hot and humid, and there was a unique architectural and cultural environment which again had evolved due to the natural and historical context. A family temple was a good example of contextual design. Situated along the banks of the local river, the architecture was simple, human-scaled and functional. The stone sculptures and the wall murals narrated so many stories and made the space feel alive. The adjoining sacred grove, apart from protecting an extremely sensitive biodiversity, also supplied the basic necessities for the temple, hence providing a self-sufficient, ecologically balanced setting. And then we had the Harvest Festival of Honor. Here in the photograph is a pukala or a flower rangoli we used to make using the garden flowers. Our home had a homestead garden. It's a traditional practice of using the adjoining garden area for cultivation of trees, vegetables and flowers for worship along with livestock, poultry and fish for the basic family needs. This made our house self-sufficient and nurtured a unique biodiversity in itself. The sketch on the right is a scene from my study room. It was very interesting to see the mongoose chasing the snakes and the snakes going after the frogs and the birds feeding on the guava and mango fruits. A food chain existed in the garden and there was so much biodiversity in just one square foot of land. Since agriculture was a predominant occupation of the region, many indigenous cultivation techniques were developed from the topography of the land, the soil conditions and monsoon seasons. The photograph on the left shows how ducks are used in the region for organic farming. They eat the worms and the pest and in return add manure to the paddy fields. While studying insect, this was one of my favorite frames. Walking from the north gate, there is this sense of curiosity which is aroused. And finally, we turn to this frame with a series of steps which lead in an upward direction. They served multiple purposes as a seating, transition, as an amphitheater, even space for installations and the interesting lighting during Navratri. My stay and internship at Brief Garden, Sri Lanka were wonderful lessons of designing in a tropical land and integrating art in landscape. A trip to Bali was a wonderful example on amalgamating religious beliefs and symbolism in design, achieving artful aesthetics using locally available materials and plants, rustic quality of the spaces and the feel of serenity in the design. And after all the travel and changing geographies, I finally felt at home in the city of Bangalore or the Garden City and started my practice in 2018. These day-to-day experiences inculcated in me an association to nature 
and may be feel its smell, textures, intricacies and its dynamic qualities. The environment in which we live can be a great teacher. And thus they formed a broad storyline for my projects. These include oneness with nature, sense of place, functional aspirations, artful ornamentation, and planting and creating a microhabitat. The first topic is oneness with nature. Nature is organic, alive, growing, and yet in constant balance. It creates an interesting theater with its diverse artists and the ever-changing seasons. While designing a landscape area for any client, I thereby create spaces which would make one observant to the fragrance, seasons, the music of nature, and the sun, rain, wind, and thus revive the senses. The first photograph is an image from a courtyard of a residence I had designed. The change of seasons, wind, rain, the sounds, every part of the outdoors gets associated with the users. These riverside cottages for a sort are tucked in a riparian ecosystem which blends with the appropriate habitat for the river. This fig tree has grown so well in a residence garden that apart from giving lots of fruits and supporting birds and insects, is also a favorite spot of the children to climb on it, thus developing a connect with nature at a young age. A simple walkway or a trail is all that one needs to experience an orchard. The simple details like reflection and patterns on water can create such a great impact on a design. The second point is sense of place. The designs aim to celebrate the spirit of the place, the culture, beliefs, be appropriate to the setting and context and thereby make the users feel at home. This informal environment thus creates joy, provides comfort, and develops a serene environment to relax, introspect, and contemplate. An empty residence site, as seen on the left, has been transformed to a cozy outdoor space using local materials and plants. The humanized scale places create a feeling of home and comfort. In both the images, natural water system is a major concept of the design, thus connecting the site beyond its site boundaries. The image on the right is of a resort where the land has been sloped to collect the rainwater as well as to ensure an unhindered view to the neighboring lake, thus borrowing from the surroundings. Another important aspect is including the functional aspirations. The question often arises while designing, what are the Indian needs of an open space? A veranda or a courtyard is more than just a transition between the indoors and outdoors. Similarly, a garden has multiple usage and needs for different project typologies. In this garden, spaces were created to relax, contemplate, play, have an outdoor space to set a table and dine to entertain their guests to, veg to do vegetable gardening. The shaded pavilion was made with customized stained glasses which blends with the colors of the turkey mosaic tiles used in the flooring as well as creates an interesting light and shadow pattern during different times of the day. As seen on the image on the left, for an old banyan tree at sight, the design aimed to celebrate the wilderness. Thus a ramped earth trail a simple bench to contemplate and locally available plants were added to highlight the sacredness of the space. The other images depict a tulsi kwate against a white background and an outdoor vegetable garden made with bamboo planters. The next point is artful ornamentation. I have always felt art and design coexist. It adds stories, warmth, color and develops an additional connect to the design. I really enjoy using boulders, customized jali, paving or even in situ made light fixtures to incorporate that personal touch to the design. In this slide, you can see four types of light fixture designs which are made using simple elements like boulders, bamboo and terracotta jali. It was so much fun to hunt select and arrange sculptures and pots at site. 
they bring in that personal touch to the space and the last pointing is planting and creating a micro habitat the planting design generally comprises a diverse of plants making the space look natural and rustic yet taped, creating a civilized wilderness. The garden is allowed to grow in a subtly controlled but visibly wild form, adding a timeless quality to the landscape. They thereby welcome a wide variety of birds, bees, butterflies in the garden, mimic the randomness of the nature and also shower a wide range of flowers foliage, herbs and fruits, thus creating a microhabitat in the site. These three images show different contexts. The first is on the fourth floor terrace where wind and sun are a major deciding factor for plant selection. The second is a site on a hot dry location surrounded with hilly outcrops. The third is an artificially created water body with water loving plants. For each context, the planting was carefully selected such that it thrives well in the specific climate, suits the aesthetics and also supports a microhabitat at the site. The planting often is mixed with herbs and medicinal plants along with nectar producing flower, flowering plants. The first image of Stachy tarfeta indica is a favorite of the butterflies. The hydrology slope of the agricultural area has been carefully studied for a farmhouse project and different zones have been proposed to create a permaculture farm. A diverse range of leafy vegetables, roots, medicinal plants, gourds, fruit trees have been listed and proposed for the project. When our time permits, I conduct nature walks at Lalba Botanical Garden. I feel it's a great way to educate and create awareness among the public about the trees and plants of Bangalore and also to make them more sensitive and observant to the surroundings. And this exploration was continuing when last year our design entry won for the International Garden Festival, which happens in the castle of chaumont sur loire in France. It's an annual competition where 20 garden designs are selected from across the world and executed at site. It was a wonderful opportunity. I got to explore Paris and experience its famous architecture, the historical and the modern ones, and to witness parks, public art installations, streets, squares, and boulevards. I was very fascinated by the public open spaces. Shaman Salwar is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and is located in a town called Blois, which is about one and a half hour train journey from Paris. The quaint town of Blua is located along the valley of Blua River and was a formal royal city. The thousand-year-old Renaissance castle is situated in a 32-hectare property. So every year, there's a theme for the garden design. This year's theme was Gardens of the Earth Return to Mother Earth. As per Greek belief, goddess Gaia is considered as the giver of life and personifies fertile earth and is a de deity comparable to Goddess Parvati. The design had to glorify the wonders of Mother Earth. Design ideas were welcome, which represented the culture of the participating country. So from numerous entries, 20 garden designs were selected. This was the first time an Indian entry had won and executed the garden design in 28 years. The design drew inspiration from the agricultural practices in India and the traditional practice of the self-sufficient homestead gardens. Mother Earth has always been worshipped as the life giver or the goddess of ripened harvest. Our annual festivals like Bihu, Onam, Lodi, etc. celebrate the bountiful crops received that year and serve as a gratitude to the blessings of goddess Prithvi or Mother Earth. So even for this design, my childhood memories and experiences played a major role. The coming four slides show the design concept. The visitor enters the 2000 square feet garden area through dense planting along with fragrant plants, which can be used for worship and was inspired from the French perfume industry. The aroma imbibes a welcoming feel 
and the planting thicket arouses a sense of curiosity. On further transition, the garden starts revealing itself. The walkway gradually opens to a wider zone overlooking a series of stepped terraces which abstract the paddy fields. With carefully selected planting palette mimicking the various stages of the paddy growth. A shallow circular pond at the base reflects the sky and the surrounding landscape. As per Indian beliefs, Prithvi Mata or Mother Earth is complementary to Dua's Pitta or Father Sky. A curved bench placed along the wider walkway allows the visitors to relax and contemplate. The planting transcends from fragrance garden to fruit, medicinal and herbs garden, deriving inspiration from the homestead gardens. The walkway further leads to the step terraces where the visitors can walk along the abstract paddy fields. The pathway finally leads to the exit point, thereby completing the circumambulatory path or Pradakshina path, paying tribute to the sacredness of Mother Earth. This is the plan, section and a detailed plant list which suits the design idea and also which was readily available at the castle premises. For the process of the design execution, two visits were made to Shomon Saluar. For the second site visit, I was accompanied by my friend Chandrakant. It was a complete new experience for both of us as we had to assist in our, our contractor in the physical site execution. We started with the leveling of the ground and digging the earth to develop the three-stepped paddy terraces. This was followed with cutting the locally available oak wood logs and making nearly 200 panels to be fixed as retaining walls for the terraces. The panels were carefully inserted and the levels checked. A very interesting detail was the use of 6 inch wide metal sheets as separators between planting and walkway and within one week the garden started taking shape. It was amazing to see other teams build their gardens completely by themselves. Their friends, family and neighbours would help in the execution. Later I came to know that their college internship involves working on site with a contractor and physical knowledge is as important as developing a good design. How wonderful it would be if we could have similar hands-on experience in our curriculums as well. I indeed started looking design detailing through a different eye post this experience from France. The garden got inaugurated in May last year. This is the entry to the design. A signage at the entrance gives a description of the design. The entry area with dense foliage and fragrant plants creates a welcoming feel and a sense of curiosity. The walkway opens to the reflective pond which beautifully reflects the sky and the stepped paddy fields. It felt great to see the pictures of the completed garden. This image is from the corner bench overlooking the reflective pond. The bench with the wide variety of medicinal plants and herbs which is commonly used in the French cuisine. The walkway leading up to the stepped paddy terraces. It's interesting how spaces respond differently to different age groups. In this image, the boy is happy walking on the bench rather than sitting on it. The garden got published in various international papers and magazines and thanks to this project, I finally got a name to my studio, Dharitri, which means earth or land. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dipti. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, it actually reminded me of Kate Winslet, if you've seen the movie, uh, which is called A Little Chaos, and how she goes out and creates this garden. It's a, it's a fictitious story, of course, of Kate Winslet being a garden apprentice, um, and she's working under Andre Le Nautre, uh, and she goes out and creates this organ garden. So, you know, these images of the garden that you did in France really did remind me of it, but wonderful presentation. There are a couple of things that I think came out pretty strongly in your presentation, and I'm taking the liberty 
of trying to moderate this because Sunit is well online, but I think he's also multitasking uh, today and it may not necessarily take the lead on this. Um, the first is, I, I think, the way that you look at influences and, you know, your references, for example, to Malgudi days or to Heidi, uh, that you're willing to look at inspirations beyond um, other landscape projects. You're, willing, you're, you're beginning to look at influences in popular culture, uh, in, in the arts, in cinema. And I think that's a, that's a fairly powerful area to be able to discuss, whether as designers, uh, where do we seek inspiration and influence from? So of course we do it from our childhood memories or places that we've experienced, but on an ongoing basis, do we really look for learnings? Do we really look for inspiration from literature, uh, from movies, uh, from theater? From, from the visual arts, from sculpture, and so on and so forth. And I think that's, an, that's a fairly interesting sort of um, topic that comes up in, in the way that, that you explain your presentation. Um, the other is the clear talent that you do. So not only is the garden that you've done in France very beautiful, but even that one image that you have of the Mystic Creek and the waterscape that you have created in that one image of the Mystic Creek is particularly an extremely powerful sort of image and very skillfully uh, put together. So I think that was really sort of something that was that was quite beautiful. Um, also, I think the way that you structured your presentation, it's almost a one-on-one -on -one for landscape architects or garden designers as to what is it that we should spend our time in which manner should we construct the way that we should think about our practice and I think you've been able to sort of decipher that and state that very, very clearly. Um, what I also liked was the manner in which you took this whole idea of symbolism and without being overtly weighed by it, managed to express it in an extremely communicable, in a very simple, in a very pleasant manner in the garden. So whether it is talking about earth and its connection with the sky, or whether it's talking about how do you enter that arena or what is the world full of in terms of its abundance, in terms of what kind of plant material that you choose. So you take symbolic ideas and you're, you, you, you can transfer them into very beautiful sort of landscapes. And that was also something that uh, um, I thought was very powerful. And one of the points that you made about, you know, how you had to go there and begin to dig your own garden and work with your own garden and sort of begin to question uh, you know, what is this pedagogy that we talk about design education and how much of the design education should be in the classrooms and how much of it should be out there. So many things that are put out there uh, for all of us to think. And I'd love to invite uh, the other discussants, Chaya, uh, Professor Vasavda, Snehal, and of course, Carrie, uh, to respond to it or to sort of, um, you know, bring to fore other ideas and other thoughts that they may have. But wonderful presentation, thank you. Okay, Maybe uh, I can start. Yes, yes. Yeah, I won't switch on the video because my connection is weak to weak. Right. But uh, uh, it, it was very, very interesting to see the development of this practice. Uh, I was particularly um, struck by the sketch of the Kerala garden where the snake was being chased by the uh, mongoose and so on and so forth. And my feeling was that those gardens, the, the gardens that you uh, called uh, homestead gardens, developed out of a kind of uh, a sort of uh, everyday practice. There wasn't any um, any intention of giving order to the garden. There was a kind of uh, something that developed over a period of time. Something grew well, you let it grow. Something didn't grow, you try it again. And animals, birds, uh, plants, people, they were all sort of interacting continuously in those spaces. Now, when you have to actually design something that is to be made at one go, then what is the question or what 
how do we capture that sense of lived time in the new format where a garden is not developing over a long period of time but is made uh, according to someone who is not going to live there i i would be very happy to discuss this with you if you if you have some ideas of this um so am um, am i audible yes yes yes, yes. Uh, so yeah like how i mentioned many times uh, with respect to the different nature experiences uh, somewhere i see nature uh, more in terms of emotions uh, i i just get the emotions of the feeling of calmness the feeling of positivity or surprises or curiosity so uh, or the change of seasons so there is so much of complexity when we look in nature uh, and it's somewhere i try to get those emotions into my designs like i ob obviously i find like the sketch which you are mentioning they were somewhere coming quite random like it was never planned it was more out of necessity those uh, this that frame was developed more of functional like the tapioca plantation jackfruit or uh, some or the weeds were growing randomly so nature at times i find they are so intricate and they are so complex no that, that's exactly uh, my question my question was yeah. that garden was a sort of a mess a uh, visual mm -hmm. it wasn't a yeah. mess in terms of life in terms of yeah. life it was working wonderfully you know things were living inside there but the visually it was a mess now when we design a garden that has to be seen rather than lived in does that bring about some sort of a change which um, uh, and is it a positive change or is it something which you uh, have to accept and go on with so dipti i mean just to just to add to what chaya is saying i think both of us recognize that that quality seems to somehow uh, find itself in your work mm -hmm. uh, you know i think very clearly if one looks at even the, the vignettes that you showed uh, these were not gardens of careful decisions about how scenic it was going to be or how well composed it was going to be or how everything was going to be neat and in in in, in its own place this was really gardens of uh, looking at a place and saying you know i think a tulsi kyara is right there but on the on the other and i also think a little bed of medicinal herbs uh, is was also needed and it needs to go there and it was really a, a set of asking questions of life of questions of living and trying to find a way in which you could sort of pack all those ideas without necessarily worrying about things that we as designers whether architects or landscape architects are very often worried about saying is it graphically sound is it you know does it seem complete and i think i think that's the kind of question that uh, chaya was posing to you yeah so many a time some projects where i find certain weeds quite attractive and they look good but uh, at times the clients they don't see it in the same perspective like they see a weed as a weed so uh, yeah so that conflict also at times happens but uh, thankfully some clients still see the beauty in randomness or the planting uh, going with planting which is quite random and mixed and it's okay to have some weeds coming out and uh, yeah it need not be perfect all the time so if you, if you have to present well. present present your ideas to clients in a visual format versus other formats would you find some other formats more interesting because the visual format imposes a certain um precision a certain uh, sense of uh, visual order and uh, you might be more interested in smells for example or the taste of leaves or etc etc or the which insect goes where um would there be another way in which we present our ideas to clients 
I think this is, this is a question which you will find as you go along because the nature of your practice is going to demand that you find other ways of presenting to your, to your uh, with the people who want the gardens. And I think it's going to be a very interesting new development if you follow what that life is telling you. And I think you are already on the way. Uh, maybe you'll find some ways and we'll learn Absolutely. from that. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Um, yes, uh, Sneha, Professor Basavda. Great. Thank you, Deepti. That was a lovely presentation. And it really took us through a, a whole realm of your life, which was really quite uh, wonderful. I think what Chaya at some times um, was uh, trying to talk about is that one is when the client or when, when the person who's inside the garden is seeing the garden as an escape while the other one is where the garden is the resource. And uh, that differentiation of the garden probably needs to come from the client also. And would you, would you try and indulge in getting the client into that act would be an interesting aspect because that might bring the change. You know, if, if, you, if you change your client, you might find the randomness that might uh, be necessary, you know. And, and that might become something that, that, that can give you probably what you're looking for in terms of the memory and, and you'll create a new symphony probably, which is not totally visual. And, and that might really be wonderful. So, so, so Dippi, just to sort of, I think, you know, it's an interesting point. Just to tell you that every time that we are, we are posed with uh, the need to try and do something dramatically different on a project, and different from the, the way that our practice is structured, for example. Um, and we know that the conventional ways of telling the design is going to lead to a client being very surprised or wondering, you know, what has happened to these people all of a sudden and why are they beginning to design like this? Uh, we very often use the tool of not doing landscape drawings. Uh, what we end up very often doing is draw paintings of the way that a life can be lived. So, you know, it could be about sitting on a, on, a, on a wooden platform looking at the skies or on top of the hill looking down upon a field. And we just sort of do images of that kind and then ask the client whether that's the kind of life that he wants to lead. Because then the design, you know, will sort of come and fill, fill up that, that gap. Uh, and, you know, like Chaya says about fragrance and about sound um, and really sort of try and create this world in which uh, the world that is going to surround the users and ask them whether they want to be surrounded. So just to tell you, you know, Snail and I, 25 years back or 30 years back, uh, we did a house and Snail helped me doing the house. And, and this was also one of my earlier architectural projects. So for the longest time, we just do drawings of the land with a forest, a field, with water. Sometimes the forest grew, sometimes the field grew. And the client kept saying, where is the house? I mean, like, where is the drawings of the house? And we kept saying, well, we still need to find out where is the house going to find a place on this landscape. And, you know, so I think very often one tries and uses different devices. Uh, and I think that's what, that's what's. That's what's being said, but yes. Uh, Professor Vasavda? No, I think a lot has been already said. And uh, Aniket, you have also summed up very well what she has done. My first impression is that it was a very innocent kind of a presentation. And that's the beauty of it. Because it seems that from her childhood, I think she was interested in landscape. And I think she has pursued that very well. You know, keeping all that she must have experienced in her childhood as a memory, which has become her strength now. So I think it is really something as though somebody is telling a kind of personal story of how one has gone about developing. And in the process of doing this, how one has identified five or six important aspects that one would encounter, you know, while working in this field. 
and in the presentation i think she has very cleverly picked up each one of those and showed us how she has dealt each in a specific situation not really worrying about putting everything into one basket and uh, you know talking about just projects you know where everything is there you know so that was also something you know which i thought was a good approach to attempting at these things slowly so that later in her life i think maybe she will realize how to put everything together and uh, in that sense i was just thinking you see i'm i'm not a great uh, you know a sort of designer about this to talk about but i think i was just thinking as to how honestly i think this is being presented you know and how if if it comes to somebody i think how one really goes about i think in terms of going about this subject you know trying to constantly put one's own mind and one's own personal you know observations into a kind of a situation slowly as she goes on you know acquiring this kind of know how to experience and uh, to sort of sum up everything i think to look at the final project is also really something you know because we you know although it was a kind of a complex competition kind of a thing uh she has achieved you know whatever she has through absolutely minimal interventions and i think that's where the strength is because i think like in the field of conservation i think landscape also one has to have just the minimal intervention with nature because everything else is in the hands of nature you can't predict it you can't presuppose you can't preimagine but i think with right kind of instincts you see that you observe in nature you sort of only initiate things you know and then you leave it to the nature so i think i on the whole really liked the presentation and i think all of you have really spoken at length about what she has done and i also like the way she has titled her practice and uh, i think dipti also could be taritri <laughs> you know <laughs> as she goes along you know <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much it was it was one of the very honest and very innocent kind of presentation i have ever seen so far so i think uh, i'm i'm very happy with you thank you did you see that's fairly high marks going by the past episodes clearly very very high marks here the but highest your... the highest the <laughs> highest no no i'm not i'm no 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 no, no. Kind of, you see i'm just trying to say that me being not so much in this field but quite sensitive about it i felt very comfortable listening to her and looking at her presentations i also like the idea of sketching you know and what chaya was mentioning but i really like the alepi sketch very much you know because i think that alepi description was really fantastic <laughs> you know so i think all the best to you thanks a lot <laughs> thank you we haven't heard from carry carry would you like to yeah i would because um Well what I I have done Shimon Sir Loire actually in 2019 so unfortunately we just missed each other oh, yes. yeah and so I was I know the garden very well and I was um talking about like how you adapt to the reality I'm curious because you were talking about how difficult it was um you're really building and you didn't have that hands-on experience I know in my experience in Shimon we had to change a lot of what we thought we were going to do and react to the materials that were available which is challenging because you're working with a quite limited budget and limited time and so i'm curious what you changed in your design and how you achieved it because you you it's it's very clear what you've achieved and very simple thing so was it diff- did you have different ideas that changed 
Uh, uh, one thing was uh, in my initial design, uh, the entry to the garden was mm -hmm. from right to left. Like uh, you enter from, uh, no, sorry, you enter from left and then you take a circle and come back. But they had suggested to reverse it because it's somewhere the Indian driving versus the European driving skill. Yes. So that's something new for me. Yeah, so I had to mirror I the design. I was thinking that when you were saying it because we always go that direction and you, yeah. <laughs> and then the stepped walls, uh, I had uh, suggested more of rubble, earth, uh, like stone or something more related to my Indian uh, way of looking at stepped uh, so terraces. The sticks were not sticks originally, they were stone. No. They had to be stone rubbles, but uh, of course, they are very costly there. And uh, oak wood is relatively much cheaper. So that was used instead. And again, the use of a pond liner for the water body, uh, I had suggested as uh, like a solid one, but uh, the pond liner was done. But I'm, I was quite happy how the circle came up so perfectly. So yeah, that was uh, It's quite a very strong clear. element because it's very clear. So all your lush plantings will contrast with it. Yeah, correct. So that was beautifully done. So yes, just very few changes, but, uh, uh, and also the planting, I had to slightly revise once I visited in January, more or less related to what is available uh, uh, in France and in the castle area. So yeah. did you keep the idea of um, the edibles and the, because you have this home study, did you use edible plants there that are, yeah, so all that uh, was uh, like 80% of the plants were what I had suggested. Uh, the rest of the plants, they were added. So herbs and all I had selected such that you find it easily in France. So that all that research had been done. Then. Wonderful, yeah. yeah, yeah. And did you get to see it in person finished or not? Uh, I couldn't see uh, just before the planting stage, uh, we had to leave because the lockdown, lockdown was announced and we had to soon pack our bags and return back. So all these completed photographs of the garden, they were all sent by the friends I made in France, plus visitors who visited there. So I was so happy to get a response from them. And uh, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, very interesting to hear. And I'm curious because the one other thing, because you were talking about the need for hands-on experience in the education there. So, um, yeah, you have, do you not, when you build your gardens in India, had, do you get in there and get dirty often? Uh, no. And, not, not no. at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, it would be interesting because I don't, we, we do have a lot of like very physical um, education. Yeah. So that, really Karen, in the Indian context, uh, you know, it's still a little odd. And uh, so in the Indian context, you can only be a landscape architect if you've done five years of architecture. So everybody has to do five years of architecture. And then it's a two-year postgrad program, uh, which is anyways very tight, very dense. Uh, you know, some colleges uh, have internships where they encourage uh, students to go and spend a couple of months out in the field uh, or in some other office, but not really, not anymore. And so really the hands-on experience of working, so how do you dibble grass? How do you, uh, you know, how do you pot, repot a plant or how do you do, um, and things like that, simple things like that. Uh, well, they're really not talked about within, in the, in the academic space uh, of education. It's something that some people uh, learn on the job, but many don't actually. And as a result, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, planting design or knowledge about plants uh, or really sort of, you know, understanding a large palette and continually sort of explore and expand that palette of plant material is something that very few firms uh, in the country do uh, regularly. So it's, it's absolutely a pleasure to look at Dipti's work you know, last time we had somebody called Deepak, uh, Deepak who also worked from Bangalore. And so there are, there are some younger practices who seem to rebel in the idea of looking at plants and making friends with plants and really sort of give, you know, thinking of them as characters in a play. But in general, planting design is not a very well served uh, area of design in the country, at least at this point. I think I think the um, appreciation of the importance of it is growing everywhere. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good to hear there as well. Yeah. So, Dipti, one last question before we move on. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, what Professor, Professor Vasavda sort of points out very clearly, and also, you know, I think Chaya recognizes it. Snail says it. Uh, in the manner in which you've been influenced, and you've got this very strong influences growing up, and you can begin to see uh, in a very innocent way to, you know, like Professor Masada says, a particularly innocent manner in which those influences seem to find home in your gardens. And now you've been to France, and you've suddenly stepped out of the country, and you've seen a whole new world, and, you know, you've it's clearly made a lot of impressions on you. Uh, do you see that beginning to change the way that you're beginning to think of landscape design? Maybe too early, but now when you sit on a piece of paper to sketch a project, do you sketch, say, do you think of it the same way that you did before this competition? And now do you begin to think of it differently? Um. So one thing which I was very inspired in from Paris was uh, how design, art, and landscape is so much appreciated even by someone who doesn't belong to a field. So uh, I like even if I speak to any person, they would know about Chaumont Lower or they know about the Garden Festival. Uh, there is there is so much of innovation happening in Paris, and one. More thing was the heritage, uh, like how uh, the historical, they still celebrate the history or the historical part of the town or the city. I, I just wish we like, of course we have cities, uh, many cities in India, like uh, Ahmedabad and other cities, but somewhere, even when I stay in Bangalore, I often think we have so many heritage structures and uh, so much of history in the city, but somewhere it's, not known to the IT crowd or to the other crowd of the city. So I wish that connect could be built. And more also in terms of materials, I, I learned quite a lot, like a simple thing as a curb. I started questioning, is that really needed that heavy cement curb versus can other materials be used to simplify the edge between the walkway and the planting uh, and different paving options or uh, open spaces, public pathways, how should they be paved? Uh, can there be other alternatives? So these were quite a lot of interesting things which I noticed there versus here. So, so I'm going to, you know, again, I think because, so I'm going to try and see whether Chaya can respond or, or sort of expand upon this. And Chaya, I mean, honestly, a question to you, uh, you know, this whole, Think of what should designers be influenced by and very often you know we are willing to say designers should be influenced by life around them and they should be influenced by their memories and so on and so forth but in a fairly directional manner uh, and in, in a manner in which I think one is in pursuit of trying to find ways of looking at the world what would you have to say, because I do know that it's something that you care about deeply, what would you have to say about the way that young designers or designers, or people like me, or all of us, uh, should look at the idea of the liberal arts, uh, the applied arts, politics, um, you know, culture, anthropology, and many other things other than spatial design as a way of suffusing the way we think about design? You know, the landscape designer or any designer is a human being, first of all. And human beings live in societies which are constantly being reshaped, uh, constantly sort of trying to find better ways of, of uh, fitting into the world. Uh, and all these subjects, the, the liberal arts that you mentioned, literature, poetry, music, uh, the arts, all of those are trying in their own ways to find something which is one, not completely personal, but is offered into the societal uh, milieu. And so every designer has so many experiences. 
but through her the experiences get filtered into something that belongs to society as a whole and that is where it no longer remains personal so the the all these things are important every human being should have the greatest diversity of of knowledge is and experiences but finally the what the human being does is as a a contribution to human culture and i think in that sense influences are not bad as long as they are always proportionally um being offered into something that's going on in the world around us and in that that way i think this innocence is a very important thing i know she um, talks about it yes <laughs> but, but at the same time there will be reflection and over time the reflection will kick in to create a more um deep rooted expression at in the beginning stage it might be something which is um re- uh, emotionally responsive uh, later on i think it becomes something which is uh, uh, almost spiritually important so that's right. how i feel about that no, no, so thank you thank you and with that uh, i think we can go on uh, to anuradha anuradha all all yours now can i can i just yes, end course, with one of thing course, of course just just a little one minute no no of course please of course. you know which i forgot to mention was her effort in lal bag yes yeah you know that is something you know which is extremely important because i think lal bag is one of the most important gardens in bangalore and kumbhi grail you know who created that uh you know and that place is currently under a great threat so i think uh, the kind of activity that you have started as a young landscape architect is really commendable and i think you should really keep it up deeply one day i'll tell you tell you about how my father learned plant material uh, so by you know he 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 topped his uh, his his exams at the agricultural college in pune and he walked up to his father and said i've stopped and you promised me a vacation so my grandfather sent him to bangalore and he stayed in bangalore for 3 months and every day in the morning he would walk to lal bag and spend the whole day there so i think lal bag is a wonderful place for landscape architects to learn about plant material but yes over to you anuradha we've kept you waiting thank you yes. thank you very much namaskar we welcome you all to the sessions of our intellectual space as landscape architects this amazing journey over last few saturdays has opened up new dimensions of thinking i thank aniket sir and lee foundation for putting together this wave of modern ideologies my firm salient is a comprehensive architecture landscape and interior design studio operating from calcutta We started our journey formally as a studio in 2005. After initial few interior designs, we got on board for architecture and landscape projects. A simple mapping of the delivery dates of various projects shows that a decent gestation period was needed till we could take on our chosen journey. As the ideology of the firm, we believe in being one with nature. Indian civilization is more than 7000 year old and in every aspect of it we have believed in admiring revering and worshiping nature according to the sutras provided by vishwakarma we design for bhogyam that's for utility sukham for aesthetics and ramya that's the transcendental qualities where the soul connects at salient we look for the evolved handshake between the built and unbuilt our designs dissolve the boundaries between landscape and architecture we cannot understand nature till we admire it conserve it and as a subset we build architecture our architecture responds consciously to bring in the elements of nature into our daily life for example Frangipani project is a set of 12 villas 
carved out as a second home for NRI residents. The box splits to accommodate central pocket gardens with a lap pool. Residents connect with the rhythms of nature in every season, enjoying the winter sun as well as the raindrops moving in and out of the two ends of the home. Same idea when applied to bigger projects like malls gave us results like city centre Raipur. Malls were a cultural shock to our normal concept of street shopping. Breaking the box at city centre Raipur allowed us to achieve passive cooling in the hot and dry city. Large water tanks and thick planting cools down the wind before it sweeps into the courtyards. A timeless colonial style architecture is adapted. Articulation of the courtyards filled with low maintenance planting connects landscape with all experiences indoors, thereby dissolving the alien air-conditioned interiors of a regular mall to a more human scale. Thus, visitors behave in a natural self. This mall now is regularly visited as a public open space. The project changed the way city perceived its harsh outdoors. In fact, all new developments in the city are now talking about integrating landscape into the building spaces since then. The response of design at times also matters in understanding the need of the place. For example, in the small town of Amtalla, there was a need of a park. So the long narrow site of the mall was developed as a series of stepped gardens and plazas so that people can connect with nature. When we go to the site, we go with an empty glass. At times, an existing grove or only a single tree can also act as catalyst for the site plan layout. This small 20 key resort was designed saving the two existing palm trees. Here again, architecture and landscape are married to each other and create a gorgeous symphony together. In another case of Rivera, view of Ganges was limited due to the bund wall. Aspiration was to have an infinity view from the common swimming pool to the Ganges. Gardens were stepped up gradually to come to raised sand bed. A stroll on the promenade or a swim in the pool connects individuals to the transcendental planes. I would also like to bring up the case of Pokhurs or Ponds of Calcutta. Geographically, landscape of Calcutta is dotted with numerous big or small water bodies. Fortunately, most of these are documented and strictly marked for preservation by the fisheries department. Due to this, developers were never interested in taking up plots with ponds for residential or commercial projects. As a result, water bodies were generally neglected and had become a place for anti-social activities. Twelve years ago, our studio took up the challenge with a developer to design apartments on a site with only 48% land. Project Jiva showed the way to the city to embrace the water bodies and develop its presence in a fruitful way. Close connection with ponds has improved the man and water relationship for city residents. Urban kids are also weaving in water stories in their lives. We are further experimenting with floating gardens, bird perching platforms and nests for added interactions. Another experience for a landscape only design project for a developer gave us a large pond which never contained water. At Calcutta, we don't line the water bodies. The clay nature of soil reduces percolation and allows for natural cycles. We had numerous meetings at site with the owners. I have a knee issue which inhibits my movement on some days every month. I had to go, uh, go around the site in an auto rickshaw 
assuring the client that once the STP starts, we should have sufficient water feeding the pond. Still, to take care of contingencies, we developed the pond base in two split levels. When there is very less water, lowermost basin shall only contain it and rest of the flat area can be used as a maidan. Fortunately, after the first rainy season, pond contained sufficient water and is now a developed ecosystem after the second rainy season. Careful flora on the edges and addition of local fauna in consultation with our biodiversity experts has natural ecology in place. Large pond requirement left us with narrow spaces around the periphery. These were broken down with walls and mounds into smaller outdoor rooms, articulated with magical and dramatical elements. Sculptures and signage became part of intuitive play of the smaller age group. In case of a typical developer project, while the site plan looks quite clean and resolved on the surface, it is usually littered with numerous services in the underground layers. This, along with additional requirement of a fire driveway, makes the design very challenging. It requires a thorough knowledge of the services so that we can negotiate or redesign the routes. Fire driveway always require an innovative solution to merge it with the design. Private residential landscape projects give a more flexible space to environment. Connecting close with the client, his family, his traditions and aspirations gives dimensions to the design. Building architecture and landscape together improves the expanse of greens. Of course, such integration requires a rigorous involvement on MEP levels. We can demand perfect finishing and embellish with elaborate artwork to achieve ethereal effects. Exuberant planting strategy maximizes the experience of outdoors. A melody of tropical leaf textures populates the palette and initiates conversations with their seasonal phenomena, thereby connecting owners with the multiple layers of happiness. Well, seeing our designs mature is terrific joy for landscape architects. Eco Space Corporate Landscape was designed in 2009. Second phase was merged and finished in 2013. It has been extreme bliss to watch the trees grow, mature and complete the narration as per the initial intent. Large trees shade the walkways through the harsh nine months of summer. Amphitheatre converts into musical festival zone every Friday. Users look forward to come down to the landscape spaces during their lunch time rejuvenate, refresh, and start their office with a calm mind. A general low attrition rate is also observed on the campus. Over years, we have seen the canopy cover mature and take shape of an urban forest. Another experience here has been the mixed breed of planting, which has helped the trees to grow fast and stand strong through the testing times of pests and storms. Rain trees, which are all vanishing fast from Calcutta due to pest attack, are till now safe and healthy here. This experience forces me to think if all the private projects can be converted into functional urban forests, the resultant thick canopy cover can take care of many environmental problems of the city. Natural calamities are a great learning episodes for all of us. Amphan made me understand how deeply we connect with our gardens. While the city suffered a huge loss of over 35,000 trees, our projects had a great blessing. Not a single tree was uprooted from the established landscapes. Closer inspection of the loss made it clear that the minimum dimensions required 
for the tree roots to hold tight with the ground have to be adhered to. At times, PCB requires us to plant trees in tiniest of spaces, but these suffer huge damage when calamities happen. If their roots cannot grow properly, they do not get the CG correct. Likewise, large trees like Spathodia, Dalonyx, and Pachira require bigger spaces for buttresses, which surface out after 10 years of growth. At the end, I would like to share experience of Swabhumi. Swabhumi is an adaptive reuse project originally built as a heart on a garbage dump of 13 acres at Calcutta. Nested between Old City and the still developing Salt Lake City, this cultural center came into existence in the late 90s as a PPP project to celebrate the cultural heritage of Bengal through performance, food and heritage. However, the development mix did not prove to be workable and failed in its commercial viability by early 2000. Redevelopment of Swabhumi sought to offer five key experiences – living, celebrating, possessing, dining and socializing by providing the Raj Bari Indians, luxury living, multiple convention halls, a retail experience, various restaurants, cafe, lounges and bars along with sprawling open green spaces. We developed the concept of truly nostalgic Zamidar Bari architecture, landscape and decor. The design solution conserves over 60% of the existing fabric and new 40% brings in the spirit of Bengal craftsmanship. In site plan, the dark grey here is the only new addition. With multiple ground levels, a deliberate attempt was to weave the changing sight lines and perspectives. The central heart is remodeled as the boutique hotel called Raj Kotir. The idea was to do minimum disturbance to all existing. Less is more. So the orange areas you see here are the only addition to the courtyard. Aesthetics is appreciated as Wabi Sabi. Imperfect, austere and symmetry all are accepted in the composition. Existing sunken open air theatre was remodeled as colonial style marble fountain and alfresco dining facilities with the backdrop of existing date palm tree. Each room has a small garden and flagstone entry through it. All the existing quota flooring is preserved. Only inserts are minimalistic tickly designs. Landscape elements are carefully woven into the existing structures making the legacy experience more authentic and connected. Careful selection of finishing materials, plants palette, bejeweled with marble fountains and vases weaves in with the Jamidar Bari culture. Being a garbage dump in past, soil allowed for a limited variety of plant palette, which was arrived at after a couple of experiments. Filigree work works like a privacy shear for veranda spaces. It's actually a surprise to see everything coming together so well from what it was before. A mystic story of a Zamidar Bari, Zamidar family, has been woven into the campus. Various rooms and gardens are detailed as per their characters in the storyline. The unique blend of colonial extravagance and relaxed informality of the Bengal's culture has been celebrated by utilizing various transitory spaces into Adda spots, a Bengal's unique social gathering spaces. The artisan's block was converted to reception and wellness block. Spaces carved in carefully protect the existing foundations and allow for artwork echoing the past. A plunge pool was designed into an existing tight courtyard. Cast iron here brings in the crisp verandas around the pool. Ferns, areca plants and banana plantation give the necessary screening for semi-open spaces. As the evening descends, 
Cordia transforms into magical hues of the past. I would like to end my presentation which, with a short video of the project. Thanks. Thank you, Honor, rather that, that clip in the end was particularly fun to watch. Uh, so, I mean, there are a couple of things I'd like to say before, you know, I'd like to invite uh, the other discussants to, to contribute. Uh, one is, I think, the graph that you showed in the beginning, and uh, I think it's a fairly potent message. Uh, landscape architecture, practicing landscape architecture in the country uh, has become a little easier in the last uh, maybe a decade, but it certainly wasn't easy before that. Uh, I know for a fact that your firm uh, has been almost a pioneer, not almost, is a pioneer in, in sort of expressing landscape design the way that you've done it in Calcutta. And, you know, India being the size that India is, uh, just because, you know, landscape architects were being accepted in Delhi or in Bombay or in Bangalore, uh, I know for a fact that that wasn't the case uh, in Calcutta. And I do know for a fact equally that that's not the case in many of the smaller towns in the country. And typically one does see that while people begin uh, with you know, doing whatever that comes to them. Uh, there are very few firms that seem to have both the stamina and the resilience uh, to sort of stick it through and uh, see the times through so that they can begin to practice landscape design. I mean, everybody, I think, begins with whatever that they get, whether it's a little bit of interior design, a small architectural extension, because, you know, landscape projects are not easy to come by. But to many of them, uh, stay in that space uh, for a long time and are unable to extract themselves from that space uh, to become full-fledged landscape architects. And I think it's a tough journey. Um, and I think there's an inspiration for all the young firms are looking at this to, to remind them that I think it's important to stick it out however longer the time is. The other thing that I think, you know, it's, it's come a few times in the last few five weeks, but not very often. Uh, at, at a very simple level, if you begin to look at the nature of practices, on one end of the spectrum, you have this boutique practice, you know, this practice that is willing to be very selective about the work that they will take. Uh, they're quite content in it also. And they will take one or two commissions or three commissions a year and really work on them very well. And that seems to work for them, for them from many levels, intellectually, financially, professionally, seems to work for them. On the other end, you have this very activist kind of, and I, I mean, I'm, I mean, I, I use the word activist quite loosely. I don't really mean it uh, in, in the sense that it's perceived, <laughs> but, uh, you know, firms that either want, for example, to make the idea of sustainability as their, uh, their key sort of, uh, bearing about how they will end up practicing. And then in the middle, you have this thick practice, this thick belt of people, which really constitutes 80, 90, 95% of the practitioners in the country. And this is what they are doing. They're going out there. They're beginning to do landscape for real estate. They're doing landscapes for, for speculative projects. They're doing 
landscapes for offices, whether they're IT offices or other offices, they're doing it for malls. Uh, and it's perhaps because of the way that academics has been, there's always been a taboo to, for that kind of practitioner. That kind of practitioner is always seen as someone who has kind of sold out at, at some level. So, you know, I remember, you know, when I was doing architecture, if somebody said I was doing work for a real, some, some, somebody said that you we were doing work for a real estate uh, developer, the general impression was that, that he wasn't practicing architecture anymore. Uh, and he had kind of sold out. And I think that taboo stays even today to a certain extent. And yet that's the reality. And in that reality, 80-90% uh, of all of us practice every day and go on our living. We're willing to take whatever comes our way. And through that, I think some people manage to extract lessons from this thickness of the practice. And I find this interesting in the kind of connections that you make. So, you know, when you talk about the mall as an outdoor space and, and the way it's been successful, and of course, we've seen Charles Correa's work uh, doing that a little earlier in, in Calcutta and becoming a very powerful idea of redefining the way the mall as a glass box was defined uh, or it continues to be defined in the context of India. And it's seen more as a set of streets uh, Choras, an open space, an old style bazaar, and to be able to sort of articulate that well. So, to take typologies and make small changes, small uh, variations in the typologies to continuously improve those typologies. Uh, the, the mall in Amantala, for example, your attempt to you know see whether you could actually build a park uh, on the rooftops of it. Occasionally, I think. You know, we also get into that space which is slightly um, an unsure space. So when you talk about the lake and the lake projects, um, it's an unsure space. Should the lake be there for the public good or should it begin to be used uh, for speculative real estate, which captures uh, natural resources in the, and uses it for private gain? And there are those dilemmas that we will we will continuously struggle. But still, then you begin to start looking at the project that you talk about how if real many private projects can actually instill the idea of urban forests in cities. And it's a very powerful case that you make. Or when you start looking at your plant trees and plant material and, and really sort of say, you know, simple things like what is the planting dimension? What is the root structure and so on and so forth when natural calamities begin to happen. So what I find interesting beyond the fact that the work is extremely competent, it's extremely articulate, it's extremely sharp, and that itself I think is commendable, knowing the manner in which speculative work tends to express itself, but that you're continually wanting to sort of extract larger lessons or typological lessons from there in a manner in which those lessons can begin to improve our idea of urbanity, our idea of going to work, our idea of living, or our idea of leisure. And I find this a very important area that's not talked about very often. Uh, so thank you for this. I mean, I think uh, for me, I was very, very happy to see it because I like to look at practices that are in the thick middle. It's always nice to look at the two esoteric ends, but it's really the thick middle that defines the way that our cities are built. And it's wonderful to see uh, the banner in which you're dealing with it. But with that, you know, I'd like to sort of invite, um, so is there something you'd like to say, Anuradha, before, um, you know, I invite uh, Chaya? Yeah. And Sir, one, a couple of small points I can add to this, like uh, what, uh, what Deepi also uh, explained quite clearly, so I, uh, I was born and brought up in Rurki, you know, a small town on the foothills of Shivaliks. And from there, after my marriage, I suddenly reached Calcutta. So which is like a complete contrast. And then uh, when you are in the city, in the thick city, you are, you're so disconnected from the, the greens, you know, you just, you don't have those normal, natural kind of things around you. You know, the sound of the birds, the, the fallen uh, leaves. You keep looking for, I think, those kind of memories which we were discussing in the earlier presentation. 
and uh, i actually i am also a student of vedanta and i keep looking for uh, small uh, inspirations from there and uh, we suddenly tend to understand that uh, nothing is uh, stable about the human body every cell in our body is changing continuously and so we have to connect with nature so if we sit inside a room which doesn't have any natural light and uh, we are supposed to perform a task we will do it in a very different way as compared to a room which is well illuminated by daylight which has got its own patterns from morning to afternoon to evening because it's changing it's changing the way we are changing i think that connection is very important so uh, we are in architecture landscape interior and it's like a comprehensive practice so we do projects which are um, all together and we do, do do some projects which are only landscape also but for our architecture projects i think we are able to do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, we can give a lot to the society over there where we can gel in our basic ideas and actually give the proper directions to the built mass so that the wind is respected the the movement of the sun is actually there in the garden so while when i do only landscape projects for uh, other architects or other developers these things are not there but when we have our own project our own uh, landscape design projects there is a lot to explore and we actually begin our designs like a war room you know so the landscape department is there and the architects are there so we fight for each and every tree everything that is there and and everything else just builds around it so i think it's it's very interesting experience when we are doing things together i i you know i i and i also have to add i mean i should have mentioned it yours is one of the very very few practices in the country that do both architecture and landscape together and i'm sure at some point of time you know uh, along the way we will try and discuss how that uh, that emerges in a studio setting but uh, chaya uh, sneha yeah yeah anuradha first of all thank you very much for reminding me of calcutta it's been years um, and swabhumi also um, all these things uh, ring bells and evoke memories so thank you for that um, the question i want to ask is slightly difficult to frame but i'll try you know uh, most of life in india especially life of ordinary people is conducted outdoors you sit under a tree or you sit by the side of a street with a shady corner something like that lots of things happen happen actually uh, outdoors and the building is a kind of a, a very glorified cupboard you know where you keep your valuables and you lock it up when required but otherwise you stay outside all the time especially the men i'm afraid uh, the women don't do that so much in many parts of india but not everywhere i mean it's it's not not universally true now that means that the outdoor space had more importance and is more textured for life and indoor space was far less Uh, carefully thought through that's my impression um now do you think that there is a reversal now that architecture takes precedence and landscape becomes a secondary input and do you do you think it should be the other way around seeing how we live so much of our lives outdoors that should landscape not be the primary and architecture be a kind of a convenience which is a necessary evil but all the time uh, has to be there what do you think about this sir so i um, i very strongly agree with you but since we spend so much of time um, uh, actually outdoors so the way our city should be the way our outdoors should be and uh, i think the way we design is how the generation the man actually responds you know it i think the buildings the spaces around us really build us so uh, i really take it as a very strong responsibility on how i am delivering my outdoor spaces how much inviting i am making them for 
uh, anyone to come around and use it you know we feel comfortable and actually feel normal i think that is what the word is feel normal so actually in this uh, in this uh, today's life of technology you find people uh, walking on their uh, in their gardens for their morning walk listening to music you know or they would be texting so i think these things are really strange you are in the garden you should enjoy the garden you should let me let me put the question slightly differently slightly yeah. differently um everything is in order in architecture inside everything is laid out perfectly and you go to someone's living room and you don't know whether you should sit down or just keep standing because it's so hard and so clear and so uh, well made in a way that it it resists inhabitation and the the good thing about the garden is that it's the opposite of that mm-hmm. that it it is it is the place of inhabitation in a loose and relaxed manner um i had a feeling looking at the mall and some of the other projects that the two things one the scale of the spaces which in india we prefer more intimacy or maybe it's because of our social life and so on if the scales were somewhat smaller and if the density of planting was higher maybe there would be a clearer sense of the of the looseness of the outdoor this is what i felt i felt that to some extent it was very very well defined and i i am a sort of messy person otherwise so i i i prefer the mess so you you must have realized that by now yep i think sir uh, architecture projects uh, to uh, quite an extent are defined by the uh, the required frs that we have to build and that kind of also controls the uh, total build up space and uh, how we can open the buildings how much we can open and many a times we are blessed with the basement on the lower level so there are a lot of uh, aspects and we try to weave in the best that we can uh, and and i'm not uh, i don't want to plant big trees where i don't have good soil i would like to put smaller ones only i'm very respectful to the nature the way it should behave normally the kind of requirements it has and wherever i have a good opportunity to plant bigger ones or really have a big burst of nature i do it but i do it very carefully because now with the experience of uh, uh, 15 years i know what is the requirement of each and every plant and how i should take care of it thank you sneha professor wasavdo carry hi anuradha thank you for this presentation I think as Aniket pointed out you're in the thick of the practice and somewhere I think uh, what has happened is that uh, we in India largely believe that large public places must be uh, must must have a certain decorum you know and and somewhere what has happened is that that decorum creates a certain formality which is what I think Chaya was talking about that 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 the idea of how i will be in the garden uh also is a response that emerges out of what that garden offers so to a certain degree when it's uh when it's extremely pristine uh it becomes uh, it is it is imperative for the other person to to behave in a certain way and i think when one is doing these large public places uh, you are somewhere looking at the idea of maintenance and you are looking at the yeah, idea of, of of a whole lot of things which is governing somewhere which is compromising maybe the kind of life that it might support you know so so it it kind of um, so do you feel somewhere that 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 range of life uh, that that is possible uh, in a normal um, setting doesn't happen over here or, and everyone is very formal in their in their approach do you think that happens 
so as you pointed out, I am uh, quite careful when I'm introducing uh, plantation landscape in every format is because you, when you plant, you have to take care and you will have mostly the basic level people to be taking care of uh, the landscape in all these uh, urban commercial projects. So I try to make the designs very, uh, you know, perceivable and uh, so the masses know how to behave and it's quite close to their life and they can connect with it. And, uh, but, but of course, whenever I get a chance, like today I selected to show projects which are more connected with architecture, but whenever we have projects which are pure landscape projects, we experiment uh, across, you know, whatever we can do. We learn from the traditional local people, we learn from the nursery walas and the old people. And also what we do is that we, in case of uh, especially developer projects, I try to understand what was there uh, 15 years, 20 years ago. And even if it had suppose a grove of 15 guava trees. So, because, you know, I believe that nature has got a very strong memory. So we get those 15 guava trees back to the site so that any uh, natural corridor that existed in that circuit, circuit you know, it comes back alive again. So I keep doing whatever my bit into these spaces. Urban spaces are very tight and very difficult. So whatever the best we can do, I put in my, you know, life into it, soul into it. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. the insight. Because I think it was very interesting for me to understand that the idea of the, the guava tree, which would have been there, had a certain life. So maybe you're talking about much larger levels than just purely looking at the garden and the setting and uh, which is what is apparent in some of the pictures. So in that sense, I think it's very interesting to understand that aspect, which otherwise uh, we, we might not notice it. So, thank you. So Sneha, just to uh, sort of recount a little bit. I mean, there is a garden called Park André Citro in, in Paris and it's done by Gilles Clément. Um, and it's I think 30 acres or something of that kind. So it's not particularly, a, I mean, it's, it's large in that sense, but it's in a sort of quasi-industrial part of Paris. And what is quite fascinating, and you know, when you start looking at park typologies in general, and you know, we do know that the history of parks evolved to a certain point, and it was a, a park with the Villa de Escrivoli that sort of broke that typology to a little, little extent, but a lot of people don't talk about Andrew Sitra. And I think what's fascinating is that that park uses both the binaries of the tamed and the untamed, the wild and the organized, and pretty much puts it cheek by jaw. So, uh, and there are different ways of entering the park. So you could be entering it from one end of the entrance and you would pretty much traverse the park through a forest and burst upon a more formal sort of arena. Or you could be coming from the other end and from the former arena, you could get sucked into the idea of the forest. And very few parks that I've seen that sort of do both so skillfully, modern parks. I think what is also beginning to happen, you know, in the manner in which Shaya is asking this question, I think more and more people are beginning to realize the need for what Shaya calls messy uh, or disorganized, is, I don't know what the word that Shaya used, uh, pure nature, sort of disorganized nature. And, and the value that it brings to you, the joy that you bring, that it brings to you, the way it suffuses your soul is diametrically very, very different from the manner in which a very organized piece of garden is likely to bring, but not to take away the value of both. Uh, and I think you're beginning to see more and more institutional projects, at least campus driven projects, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, educational institutions or, or, or research institutions, which are beginning to sort of test these ideas continuously. So it is the idea of the formal realm that, that with the forest that sort of goes through. And I think real estate, where possible, is beginning to slowly come to that idea from a laundry list of, we need a walking track, we need a pebble path, we need a pool, we need this, we need this, to... We want a place for people to grow. And, you know, and I think that shift is happening slowly. But, uh, and, you know, it's a difficult shift because real estate's about money, it's about selling, it's about brochures, it's about imagery. And, you know, nobody wants to be the first person to change 
what is the accepted way in which uh, selling happens. But I think you're beginning to see that shift and uh, hopefully we'll see a bit more. But yes, you're right. Yes. Carrie? Professor yeah. Carrie? Well, what I'm, I'm curious about and what I'm hearing in Anorat, I'm, I'm, I don't quite know how to pronounce your name, Anorat's response. Yeah. What we're struggling a lot with in Europe, in the States, is finding people who can take care of the plantings, who have this knowledge to understand the wilder plantings. And what I'm understanding from your answers is that you want to um, create plantings that you know can be well cared for so that your client is pleased. And um, I'm curious how that dialogue is going with the people who are caring for the plantings and how they can become more knowledgeable to take care of perhaps more complex plantings. How, how was, yeah. So I actually uh, uh, built up a relationship with the client and uh, even after handing over the project, we kind of stay with them for first two, three years because I think that is the minimum time uh, the garden takes to start giving its mature uh, shape. And uh, by, I think by the end of uh, first year or second year, we try to make a maintenance manual for bigger projects. So wherein we uh, kind of photograph each and every area and club it with a master plan so that you know anybody later on or anybody in the association uh, management who is taking care has something as a ready reference to refer to as to what has to be taken care how you know because if you start uh, clipping uh, tr trimming every shrub then you will not have flowers so we have to define as to how much you have to uh, hedge it out and how much you have to keep it that way so the, we do this as a practice as a responsibility not charging anything for that Okay, well, that's, that's very interesting. And, and do you find that um, as you grow with the projects, you can get more um, adventurous in what you're trying? Do you yes, absolutely. Every project teaches a lot more and it helps us uh, also to understand how to connect various factors uh, more with the clients and make them acceptable to our ideas. So I think it's, it's a continuous learning process. And I think that's the fun about this profession. Yeah, I, I agree. And some beautiful work. Very, very promising. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Vasavda? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, some of the, uh, you know, points that I would like to understand. You mentioned that you all, you have both, you know, architecture as well as landscape combined as a kind of practice in some of your projects. Now, how many of these projects were shown here today? Um, where you most, had both in your hands? Uh, I think most of them were uh, both in our hands, both. except for uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the lake project, which did not have water. That was only landscape project, which we got for a developer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think, yeah, the, and EcoSpace, my first project which actually made the difference, uh, what Aniket sir mentioned in the beginning. So that was my first project, which I delivered in 2008, after starting my practice in 2005. And that was only landscape project, wherein, uh, so it was a 20 lakh square feet of a commercial project. And I had to make this uh, two acre of garden in the center for the corporate uh, people. So I think that there is where mm -hmm. I could deliver uh, my ethics along with the requirement of the client. And it, it just worked very well together with the blessings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the clients also give you some kind of a program before they ask you to design landscape or you develop it and uh, you suggest. I mean, how, you know, for example, in architectural works, you see the client's involvement is, you know, quite intense, you know, at times. and. Uh, I just want to understand how it is in the field of landscape. I mean, do they really sort of, do they have any specific requirements for landscape or is it something that you always propose and educate them about it? Uh, sir, I think it, it is uh, generally there with the, with the clients, but uh, what happens is that we come with our own uh, set of uh, thoughts about the uh, entire program. And uh, we try to re-decipher what they're saying and uh, put it our way and then help them through the entire thing so that they can actually understand it and respect it and we go ahead together. 
So it's different in case of uh, private projects and in it's different in case of uh, corporate projects and residential projects. So we kind of work around it. So obviously developers mm -hmm. come with their list, but you know we try to uh, show them more values. For example, suppose if they have a beautiful uh, river view next to it, or if there is a you know there is a Sarso Kate around, you know. So so we try to open up their views, open up their sites to other better things around, and how we can also add on to the project with those things. It works quite well now. Mm -hmm. But do you just think to, when it just to just to just to answer the question a little uh, uh, explicitly, I think that you're right that when it comes to architecture, and particularly when it comes to real estate architecture. Uh, every square inch uh, is accounted for uh, because you know it's something that you're selling. So the level of efficiency, uh, the, you know, the FSI utilization. I mean, it's a very, very how should I say? It's a it's a it's a very tiring uh, game to to work in that real estate realm. But when it comes to landscape, uh, I think things are a little more open. So you know, I think the kind of breeze that you get in real estate is really more experiential, which is to say that, you know, when people drive in, the sense of arrival should be very beautiful, or yes, of course, we want a play court and a, and a nice children's play area, or, but it's a more, it's a laundry list, but it's not an accounting of the space. And very often the interpretation of that laundry list is really up to you to decide what you want to do with it. But it's really within that laundry list that uh, the great possibility of uh, real estate landscape design or real estate design uh, is embedded. But yes, sorry. Uh, so if that helped. Clarify. No, I just w was trying to understand, you see, because when it comes to public, you know, public buildings, public places, places like mall, you know, I think it must be really a difficult task, you know, to deal with landscape, you know, which is integrated within the building. Because it also amounts to some kind of you know, sort of, uh, you know, safeguarding the nature of landscape when it comes to too much of public use, you know. So what kind of decisions, you see, one would really make, you know, when it comes to really these kind of projects? You see? This is something, you know, which I was trying to understand. Because just broadly comparing the mall that we saw and the private development, you know, which we were mentioning, Swabhumi or something, you know, there was a kind of stark difference, you see, because some, the, the other, you know, project was something, you know, where not so much of public, you know, but it was some kind of a, you know, secured area. Whereas when you talk of mall, I think it is something, you know, where to secure, you know, the landscape and, you know, other, you know, kind of, uh, you know, adornments that you really uh, do there. Is, is many times quite insecure, you see, because of the extensive public use, you see, of the building. So this is where I was just trying to understand this, you see. So, uh, but it is interesting, you see, because I think the way, you know, the, I mean, I was, I was really impressed with the kind of cleanliness, you see, within the landscape area, you see. I mean, that must be really a huge task to maintain, you know, and I don't know. This is what perhaps must be also something, you know, which Chaya was mentioning, you know, in terms of messy, you know, <laughs> the nature, you know, being messy, you know. So I think this is something, you know, which was quite, uh, quite a different uh, experience, you see, to sort of control, you know, such kind of landscape to such a level of, you know, cleanliness. You know, so yeah, very interesting to see these large projects, and thank you very much. But I'm sure you are in a very different place than Rurki, because I have been to Rurki many times, and I think Rurki is a very different place than Calcutta. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> so one small thing I would like to add here, you know, actually normally uh, when we talk about landscape, we only we only think about plants. So actually, uh, in, in entire development... Well, I don't think like, so. At yes. least I don't do that. I don't do that. So it's also about creating those open spaces, the plazas, how people yeah, yeah. sit there, yeah, yeah. how they connect. Yeah, no, no, the I mean, I, I take correct. landscape in a much larger, you know, much larger, you know, meaning. 
and i also you know because i i have studied cities also you see and we now see cities also as historic urban landscape where everything is sort of integrated so i i look at landscape in a much larger sense you know so yeah, absolutely no anurad i think you know just um, to leave you with some last uh, questions i think you know the other thing that i that i also realize is that um, and i don't think we talk about it enough but it's one thing to be uh, a landscape architect or an architect working in amdavad for example because uh, there's a fairly large educational uh, institutional sort of thinking support that is there continually available to you i mean the quality of conversation that you can have about design or design thinking is very different when you're located in some of the cities for example about bangalore to a certain extent delhi to a certain extent bombay um do you ever feel the isolation of being away uh, in a place where you don't get uh, the the chance to talk about your work uh, with people or to get people to critique your work or to be, get people to look at your work our you know, clients are clients and clients will be happy or they'll be you know not happy I and mean, i think that's a different story but i think for all of us professionals to be able to create a circle of discussion so to say a circle of uh, of being able to get feedback uh, is a very important uh, part of honing our thinking every day uh, does being in calcutta which is a little away from the center of where a lot of this discussions happen has it ever bothered you or it's never troubled you at all sir uh, i absolutely agree with you like initial few years were uh, i was absolutely alone there was you know no one to understand what i am saying and why do i want it so but i think over a couple of years uh, i've realized one thing that we can get feedback from you know anyone who is positive about the subject and there are different types of people who can actually give you uh, you know a lot of uh, ideas lot of learning so you have to give them start understanding their responses from your perspective and a lot of uh, discussions happen which are quite nourishing so i think i found my way that way but academically certainly i agree with you that there is a gap uh, as far the, as the landscape is yeah, concerned and the other sort of you know for firms that do both which they do architecture and landscape you know very often the accusation is that your architecture is too architecture and your landscape is too landscape and the twain do not meet uh the expectation always is that if you're a firm doing both then you know the interpenetration of the architecture and the landscape is something that needs to be demonstrated i understand that you know that's difficult when you're talking about real estate projects but certainly when you're talking about more private projects the expectation very often is why is it your architecture uh with a capital a and why is your landscape with a capital l and why don't i really see the merging of the two or the interpenetration of the two uh what do you have to say about that? sir i think uh, me and vivek uh, my husband who is an architect and uh, he's a principal of the practice with us so both of us i think we have been able to connect uh, both the things uh, both the disciplines quite well together and over the years uh, i have understood his uh, uh, requirements and he is quite respectful to my uh, needs So I think uh, both ways it has been a win-win situation as far as uh, our justice to the projects has been. Right, right. Is uh, does Gary or Chaya want to end the evening with something or? No, I think I am fine. I am I am quite uh, satisfied with the the evening's uh, various discussions. Yes, thank you, Gary. You are good. No, I'm. I don't have anything to add. great so thank you again thank you anuradha thank you dipti thank you both of you for this wonderful wonderful presentation uh and for all the people listening uh this is our penultimate episode uh, the next week on saturday is where six weeks come to an end so please come back again and thank you for coming today and have a great evening thank you again mm-hmm.